Today is Sunday, March 13. I'm Pastor Anthony, and this is a Lenten Sermon Edition of Wilderness Wanderings. morning as we prepare our hearts to receive the gift of God's word, I invite you to join me in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word and the gift of your spirit and the gift of your son. And we pray that you fill us now with the power and working of your Holy Spirit to, to open and to heal and to make ready our eyes to see all the good gifts that you have given us. And may you fill us with your spirit so that our ears and hearts and minds might also be open to what you might speak to us today. And may it be a gracious word of love, a balm for our souls. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. These words from Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Actually, we're going to start one verse before that, you know what? Um, It's not on the screen, but we'll start one verse before that, just because it, well, it forms an inclusio, you'll get it. Uh, So we're going to start at chapter 19, verse 30, and read through 20, verse 16. These words from Jesus. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Four. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. So he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will give you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing around here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also then go and work in my vineyard. And when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So, when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who is hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So, the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Last week we focused in on pride, a being too full of ourselves, estimating ourselves too highly. Today we focus on pride's reversed neighbor, envy. And envy is actually an acute sense, as I said, of our emptiness, of what's missing in ourselves or in our life. Envy is a sense of what we lack. Now, it could be a lack of a physical thing like the right car or the right house or the right brand of clothes or hairstyle or diet or body or weight or workout, etc. It could be a lack of position or status as defined by a relationship or a job, our wealth, our role, positions of influence or platforms of influence. Or 
It could be the lack of something inherent within ourselves, like lacking a feeling that we lack the right job skills or the right way with words or the way with people or whatever else we may find wanting in our own character or competencies. And we often discover our lack of one of these things when we see someone else that has it. Envy, in that way, is often a social disease. I mean, it certainly can arise from unfavorable comparisons that we make with our own internal ideals and expectations as we should on ourselves. I should be this. I should do this. I should have done that. But envy also flourishes when it has an external object of comparison. Dante, in his divine comedy, still gives some of the most potent caricatures of sin and its remedies. He suggests that the way to counter envy is actually to show, sew your eyes shut so that you can't see or make those comparisons with others. Or as Jesus put it more bluntly in the Sermon on the Mount, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. He was talking about lust at that time, but I'm sure the green eye of envy could fall under the same advice. Now, advertisers and companies play on our envy all the time, sometimes manufacturing it out of thin air. We may not know that something is missing in our lives until they tell us, check it out, the new iPhone 25. Well, I was happy, with, but now my merely 15 camera iPhone 24 feels a bit inferior. You realize I don't have enough. Marshall McLuhan commented about how fashion generates or even becomes currency by constantly changing what is current, obsoleting our wardrobe almost as quickly as we put it on, as our envy notices someone else that has something better or something newer or something more special or unique. Of course, we don't need advertisers and industries to tell us when we're missing out. We've always been able to do that quite fine all on our own. Glancing over the fence at our neighbor's yard or family can do the same thing. It's even worse with colleagues and friends who we regularly exchange stories of purchases and home renos and vacation ideas with. Of course, social media simply gorges our envy on its finest feet to date in human history a never-ending buffet of all the things, all the people, all the places, the news, the ideas, the feelings, the emotions that we are missing out on. We sometimes use these platforms for news and sometimes for communication, but envy really goes home the winner when we open an app. And that is why I think that envy is actually at the root of most of our kind of cultural malaise in this particular moment. Now, this envious sense of lack may lead to all sorts of things. It may lead to hatred of the person who has what we don't. It may lead to competitiveness. I will show you that I can have or am worthy of that thing that I don't have. It can lead to complaining, grumbling, It can lead to glee at someone's downfall. They always have those things that I want. Good good that they got what they deserved. Envy, for instance, is at the root of the elder brother's party pooping on the prodigal. I don't even get a goat, he says. It's also at the root of Cain's murder of his brother Abel. But while these these may be the fruits that grow from envy's vine... They are actually not the thing itself. Envy is firstly a sadness, a hollowness, an emptiness. Envy is an acute sense of what we do not have that leads to a sort of melancholy, a sorrow, a suffering. This is why envy is said to be green, because it's sick with sorrow at the things it feels it is missing, but that it ought to have. Now you might wonder, is that really a sin then? To just be sad about missing out? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. It's a question that you can actually ask about pretty much any of these seven deadly sins really. 
Perhaps that's why the desert fathers like to talk about them less as sins and more as evil habits of thought that are the jumping off point for a whole variety of sins. In that sense, the seven deadly sins are probably better descriptors of our inherent sinful nature than they are of any particular sinful action. The seven deadly sins lie at the roots of all other sin. These seven sins give language to describe, therefore, our, the motivations of our hearts that incline us toward all evil. I'm thinking of what James says in the first chapter of his letter. I think Pastor Michael made mention of it last week too. That each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own desire and enticed. That, that first sentence, that is the place where the seven deadly sins like envy function. At that initiating level, the level of our desire and the motivations of our hearts that tempt us and call to us that aching, gnawing sense of incompleteness that can be the launching point. Because then, after desire has conceived, James goes on, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Hence, the deadly part. So putting it all together then, the temptation of the evil desire that is envy starts from the sorrowful perception that something in ourselves or in our life is missing, incomplete. As it turns out, Jesus tells a story about just that thing. But first, we have to back up a little bit to the wider context. Because in the chapter just prior, a rich young man had come up to Jesus to ask what it was that he had to do to gain eternal life. Jesus told him, keep the commandments, which the young, man, the young man had, in fact, done, but not yet content. It's important to pay attention to the words in this story. Not yet content. He pressed further. What do I still lack? The young man asked. Despite his wealth and his righteousness, something within him still felt incomplete. What do I still lack? He asks. If you want to be perfect, Jesus replies, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, then come, follow me. At that, the young man turned and went away. How? Sad. He went away sad. He learns that the thing that he lacks is something that he is not so quickly able to get. And so the sorrow of his envy begins to set in. You see, up until this point, the young man had filled his perceived lack with piety, with obedient living, and with wealth and its creation. But now Jesus answers this man's gnawing, envious desire to gain what was lacking by inviting him to fill it with nothing more than Jesus himself, emptying everything else out in the process. The man rejected this generous, life-giving invitation into communion and fellowship with Jesus, however, in favor of nursing the comfortable sadness of his envious feeling of missing out instead. As the rich young man walked away, Jesus told his disciples how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were taken aback. Well, if a rich and righteous person like that can't get in, who then can be saved, they say. In other words, if if he didn't have enough to do it, being faultless according to the law as he was, then we certainly don't have enough to do it. The disciples had immediately become aware of their own sense of lack. And Peter gives voice to it. We have left everything to follow you, Jesus. What are we going to get for that? In reply, Jesus does, in fact, note a few rewards, even as he promised the rich young man that there would be treasure in heaven for him. But then he sticks this disclaimer on the end. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first, he says. And that is the verse directly before our parable, and it's the same phrase that kind of shows up at the final verse of our parable too, meaning that this whole parable is, in a sense, an answer to Peter 
an answer to the disciples, an answer to the young man, and quite generally a commentary on this whole envious exchange. The parable goes like this. A landowner goes out in the morning looking for X amount of workers to do X amount of work in his vineyard. He finds them, and he offers to pay them the proper wage for a day's labor. The the going rate was a denarius, and so he offers to give them exactly that, to which they agree. Having their verbal contract in hand, he sends them off to do the work. But then he goes back to the marketplace at 9 a.m., noon, and 3 finding more and more workers. And this time he agrees to pay them not a certain amount, but to pay them whatever is right, that is, what is just and what is fair. So then these groups also go out to the vineyard. Finally, around 5 p.m., the landowner goes out one last time, just an hour before the end of the day, and this is where he reveals his heart. Because he finds even more there who are without work, He doesn't make any sort of arrangement with them at all. He just tells them to go work, which they do. He gives them the dignity of work because nobody else would hire them so that they can go home to their families with dignity, saying, I work today and I earned a day's wage. His generosity is also creating justice and wholeness in community. Anyway, an hour later, the day is done. And it comes time to pay the workers Now, if the first people in had also been the first paid, everyone would have gone home happy, wouldn't have they? No one's green eyes would have caught sight of the surprising generosity in store for the workers who did the least work. The glass would have stayed half full. But the landowner makes a point. I want everyone to see this, to see how things work in my house. And so... The last in are called up first to the pay table. Though they'd only worked an hour, they each get a full day's wage. Again, this this generous um, gift that that starts to create wholeness and, and restores these people to dignity in the community as well. Of course, that part gets lost in the parable. But they each get a full day's wage. That part doesn't get any airtime because among the workers hired first in the day, all of a sudden a new desire has sprung to life. Well, if they got a full day's wage, then I ought to get 12 times as much. I worked 12 times harder, 12 hours instead of just one. But then they receive exactly the same amount. And so immediately they feel the letdown, the lack, the profound sense of disappointment and sadness at missing out on what ought to have been theirs. And from this envy, this, this, this ache, springs their grumbling complaint against the landowner. You have made them equal to us, they say. In response, the landowner reminds them of the terms of the contract which he had upheld. He further reminds them that his money is his to give as he sees fit. And he has indeed given even to them. And then very perceptively, he puts the question back to them. Are you envious because I am generous, he says? In the original Greek language of this parable, his statement quite literally reads, is your eye evil because I am good? That green eye of envy shows up here again. And it's true. Had they not witnessed the landowner's generosity, it never would have occurred to them that they were missing out. And so instead of seeing his generosity as an invitation to go and do likewise, to live with surprising generosity out in the world, it instead becomes a story simply about them and how they were cheated unjustly, how they didn't get the good things they deserved. Now, of course, we don't know what the vineyard workers eventually did. Did they take their denarius and go? Did they throw it back in the landowner's face as a way of cleansing and canceling, rejecting the good because of their own feeling of being hurt and rejected? Sometimes we do get even in just those ways. Or did they perhaps pause, think and feel it over and make amends, accepting the generosity and their own participation in it with gratitude and joy? 
We don't know. We don't know what they did because Jesus doesn't say. That final question, are you envious because I am generous, is just left hanging in the air. I think Jesus intends for it to settle into our hearts. Now perhaps you recognize already envy in all sorts of places in your life. Perhaps in some of those same places that have been mentioned already this morning. Whenever we feel that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, we're in the land of envy. And we feel the letdown of whatever it is that we are missing out on. But what Jesus calls us to in this parable is actually even a little bit deeper than that everyday run-of-the-mill kind of envy. Jesus is calling us to see how envy also becomes a barrier to our relationship with him and to our free and unhindered reception of his grace. Are you envious because I am generous, he asks. It's exactly what happens to the rich young man. Jesus offered himself to this young man. Come and follow me, he says. Give everything else up and have nothing but me, and you will have not just life, but treasure in heaven as well, Jesus tells him. The young man could not so easily give up his elite sensibilities of what constituted perfection in favor of communion with Jesus. He could not see a way in which Jesus really could be enough to fill up all that he felt that he lacked. The workers in the vineyard have the same problem, except this time in the social arena of God's kingdom. Was this living wage denarius enough for them? Well, it had been. It's what they had agreed to. Until they found out that other less deserving folks got the same thing, at which point God's grace was found wanting. This was the issue for Peter and the disciples too. They had given up everything to follow Jesus and be a part of his kingdom. But all of a sudden it seemed that someone far more worthy and wealthy than they were was denied entrance. So how on earth did they have enough to get in? The disciples all of a sudden felt a deep sense of lack. They needed assurances from Jesus. What are we going to get out of this gig, Jesus? Are you going to abandon us? We're not enough as if they needed more than what they already had in the simple gift of Jesus himself. Now, there certainly can be that comparative, competitive sense flowing through the church as well. What do you mean late-coming, sinned, all-their-life sinners will be made equal to those of us that have fought against sin and won or have kept every rule in the book throughout our lives, Jesus? What do you mean that you are going to make them equal to us? If your salvation and your grace are really worth that little, that you give it out so indiscriminately to undeserving people, then I should be able to expect something more, shouldn't I? There is something offensive and utterly mundane about Jesus' socialist policy of flattening everyone onto the same payment plan, the same wage. It doesn't matter how much you've sinned, doesn't matter how much you've contributed. It is the same salvation and kingdom and promise for all. An invitation into the same baptism. An invitation to the same ordinary table with its same meager, ordinary food. Whether the first or the last, we are all of us invited. And we all receive the same, the same love, the same grace, the same redemption. Is it enough for us? Or is there still something lacking? Is Jesus and him alone enough for us? Enough to fill up all that we lack and draw us into his generous communion of joy once again? Or does envy keep us unfulfilled and grumbling at the pay table where grace is poured out? simply sick with a well-nursed feeling of deficiency. It seems to me that Jesus does not only tell this parable to illustrate how the last will be first and the first will be last. It seems to me that he tells it also as a way of confronting our disappointment about that fact because he knew we would be disappointed about that reversal, that equality with others. The envious desires of our heart 
tempt us away from taking joy in the generosity of the Father. Firstly, in regard to his generosity toward others, because the gifts that they have or receive awakens our sense of deficiency and missing out. But when envy sins have become full grown, we lose the capacity even to receive the generosity of the Father that is offered to us. Like the rich young man or the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal, we eventually prefer the familiarity of our own sadness, of our own story of lack and of missing out over joyful communion with our Lord, restoration in relationship and fullness and wholeness that he gives and that he promises. Envy is a deadly sin. It keeps us from the table. It keeps us from God. And so Jesus' parable is an invitation not only to recognize our envy, but also to take up our cross and to die to it, to be forgiven for it and to receive with gratitude our welcome once again, our equal, ordinary, old welcome at his table once again. New life in Christ on the other side of envy is the restoration of relationship in communion with God, whereby we discover that in him we are already fully loved and completely whole lacking nothing. The virtue that arises out of this new life in Christ is an ability to find contentment with the mundane, the ordinary, even the deficient, and to find balance, whether we are the first or the last, the haves or the have-nots. Our sense of lack is slowly replaced with a simple gratitude and thankfulness that what we have, because of Jesus, is enough. It takes healed eyes to see this. And that too is one of those slow works of Christ over the course of our lives. Eyes that once saw all the things that others have that we don't finally begin to see all the good things that we do have right here in front of us in the present moment. And that is a gift of God. This new life and restored sight brings a peace about our status in the world and our abilities, our possessions, our body, our relationships, our family. It gives us the ability to feel sorrow without being consumed by it. And it also gives us the, the capacity to enjoy feelings of joy once again without immediately feeling that there is something wrong because of it. In this way, our emotional world is also healed it is deepened, and it is balanced. But of course, none of these gifts of new life in Christ are more significant than the gift that he gives, him, gives us of himself. He gives us the fullest measure of his love, surrounding and enveloping us within his love. He restores and secures our relationship with him in such a way that we will never be abandoned nor need to fear abandonment ever again. And he makes us whole and complete, lacking nothing in Jesus Christ, a fully restored human being who is able to live in the fullness of their unique humanity. This is the gift that we have been given in Jesus. It is the new life that he gives all those who die to their envy each day by daily taking up their cross and following him a little more each day. And so as we come to the table again today, hear that invitation of Jesus afresh. Come to me, he says, and I will fill all that you lack. I invite you to join me in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, we are acutely aware of all the things that we lack and that we are missing. Some of those may be perhaps more superficial or small, and some of those things may be very deep indeed. Losses that we have grieved deeply, sorrows that we carry with us daily. Lord, we need your healing presence. 
We need you to heal and redeem the sorrows and the hurts of our hearts with your love. Fill us with your love. Surround us with your love. Redeem us through your love. Forgive us for nursing our sorrows and our senses of incompleteness. And help us to trust and to see your gifts of grace that meet us with sufficiency, and that fill us up and make us whole once again. We pray that you do that work in us. Heal our eyes, make us whole, secure our relationship with you in your love. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you'd like to catch the full worship service this sermon comes from, you can find the YouTube link in the notes. Hope you'll join us again tomorrow now as we continue our daily devotions and our wilderness wanderings, particularly through this Lenten season, through the Gospel of Luke and his account of Holy Week. So, as you journey on into this week ahead, go with the blessing of God. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.